Hello everyone, Philip Shields here with part two of Is It the Father, or Is It the Son of God, or Is It Referring to Both? As we read through especially the Old Testament, there are just so many groups out there that either end up sidelining Jesus Christ, and everything is the Father, or sidelining the Father, and everything is Jesus Christ. He becomes the sole Savior, the sole Creator the sole God of the Old Testament. When we read about God, it's supposed to be just about Jesus, not the Father. And so whole sermons and titles of articles, who really is the God of the Old Testament? And I did part one, I hope showing, I hope that, first of all, God the Father from time immemorial has always had a starting hand, a big hand, as he was involved in everything that happens in the universe. God Most High, whom we know as our Father, is also called the Creator. Ephesians 3, 9, God who created all things through Jesus Christ. So it doesn't contradict John 1, 1. Yes, Jesus Christ was the one who ended up doing it, but the one who planned it, coordinated it, was God the Father. So he's also called the Creator, as is Christ. God the Father is also called the Savior. Gave many verses last time. He's also called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as understood by Peter in Acts 3, 13, and Acts 5, verse 30, and Paul also, I think in Acts 22, mentions it. So along with Christ, our Father was also God of the Old Testament, for sure. If that's not clear to you, or if you missed part one, please go back and study. Let's ask God's anointing and blessing. Dear Holy Father in heaven and Jesus Christ, our Savior, who is also co-Savior with God the Father, I just ask you in your name, Jesus, that you will bless this teaching, this sermon, and people will have attentive ears. You know, your word speaks of those who receive the seed, the word, and so on with a humble heart, a willing heart, a fertile land receiving it. I pray that's what you give us here today. Please help this be your word, dear Father. Let it be absolutely true. And I pray that those listening will leave with an understanding of your greatness, your awesomeness, dear Father, your involvement. I think there's been an effort by Satan to try to sideline you. No, you're not sidelined, not by this ministry, but neither are we going to minimize or diminish or cancel the role Jesus of Nazareth also plays as your son. So in attempting to put you, our very own father, back in the rightful place as originator, absolute leader, number one in the universe, God most high, we certainly do not want to sideline Jesus. In Jesus' name, Yeshua's name, amen. So please listen to part one before listening to this one. Please print out the notes ahead of time to help you follow along without reading ahead. I hate it when people read ahead. <laughs> but follow along and, and keep up with the scriptures instead of me having to wait for you to find it in your Bible and, um, and then read it. Now, just some quick reviews on this page. God the Father is called God Most High. There's only one called God Most High. And so Jesus, or Yeshua, was called the Son of the Highest. He shall be the Son of the Highest, Luke 1, 32 and 35. Even demons acknowledge that Jesus, when he was on the earth, they would shout out, You, the Son of God, most of the Most High God. And the scriptures, Mark 5, verse 7, the Son of the Most High God. Don't torment us before our time and all that. And there's only one God Most High, and that one... Is the one we're privileged and blessed enough to know as our Father. Again, God the Father has always been, number one, not co-equal with His Son. The head of Christ is God, 1 Corinthians 11, 3, and has always conceived, always started, always been the architect to design all the plans, all His will, no doubt many, many times with the Word beside Him, but it starts with God the Father. And then he implements his will through his, and his plan through Jesus Christ, as I showed last time. Of course, while Jesus was a man on earth, guess what? God Most High as God 
was the one doing everything else. He was the one running the universe, sustaining the universe, sustaining life, answering prayers, coordinating world events to his will, and much more. God Most High was certainly ultra-active while Christ was on earth. I don't know if we consciously think of that. So last time I used the notion of, of Henry Ford being called the maker of the Ford cars that bore his name. All those cars were actually made by the assembly, the created by the assembly line workers. They were put together, but the creator was Henry Ford. In a sim similar way, God the Father, God Most High, created all things and then assembled it all, if you will, through Christ. Ephesians 3, 9 is one of many that say that. I want to continue the topic today. We'll cover Echad, E-C-H-A-D, Echad. A lot of people say Echad, but it's Echad. The Hebrew word used in Deuteronomy 6, 4, that the Lord, the Lord is one. And first, though, let's quickly touch on a few more things. Again, God most high is God in the highest, is God the Father. Okay? Then there's the Word of God, who is also uncreated God, who always existed, who became flesh, John 1, 14. Do not buy into anybody telling you that Christ was a created being. Don't listen to that satanic heresy. We know him as Jesus, or by his Hebrew name, Yeshua, meaning Savior, salvation. God Most High is number one in the universe. He's head of Jesus Christ. In fact, God Most High is called the God of Jesus Christ, which I don't hear very many, I don't hear any sermons on that point. I'm sure they're being preached. I'm not hearing them. God Most High is the God of Jesus, who is also God. But he has a God over him. Ephesians 1 3, Ephesians 1 17, John 20 17. Mary, uh, Mary Magdalene, uh, let go of me. I must, I have yet to ascend to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. We rarely have that explained to us. Uh, nowhere are we told there's any further God beyond God in the highest. He is the highest. God Most High sets the plan. Jesus always does what the Father's will is. He speaks his Father's words. He does his Father's works and, and will. He does what he's commanded to do, and he does it perfectly. Let me read John 14:10. Do you not believe that I'm in the Father and the Father in me? Of course, the Holy Spirit was in Christ, but he identifies that Spirit as the Father in me. The words I speak to you, I don't speak of my own authority. John 14, 10. But the Father, I hope you printed off those notes. But the Father who dwells in me, just like he dwells in me and you. John 14, 23. If we abide by his word, my Father and I will make our abode in your home, in your, in your life, in your body. Okay. John 14, 10. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. Explain that last time. God Most High creates, saves, and leads through Christ, and the miracles of Christ were not done by the human Christ, but by Father in Him. Just read it. As I showed you last time, Father, God Most High, was also very, very involved with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the nation of Israel, and David, and the prophets. If that's not clear, go back to part one, but we'll hit on that again today. You'll be surprised how much. Peter and Paul both understood the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, um, glorified his servant, Jesus, Acts 3.13. Acts 5.30, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered. Acts 5.30, even Melchizedek, priest of God Most High, who may well have been a theophany, a revelation of Jesus Christ, according to Psalm 110.4. We'll read that in a minute. Um, hang on. It said that Abraham was of God Most High, Genesis 14.18. So Abram knew about the one who we know as Father, and David certainly did. And David in Psalm 110, verse 4, says, Adonai, Christ... That means the Lord, my Lord, 
was a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's after he says Psalm 110, verse 1 and 2. So he himself, David, was very aware of two beings up there called the Lord. All capital L-O-R-D is Yehovah or Yahweh. L it's Y-H-V-H. We don't know 100% for sure how it's pronounced. Uh, said to my Lord. So Adon means Lord. And when you put an A-I on the end, it means my. So my Lord. Yehovah said to Adonai, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Yehovah shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Peter later on used that passage I just read you on the Feast of Pentecost sermon he gave, uh, Acts 2, 34, 36. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, after he quoted Psalm 110, verse 1, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Let's continue reading on a little bit more in Psalm 110, verse 3 and 4 uh, and 5. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power, talking about Yeshua. In the beauties of holiness. I love that. In the beauty or beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of, of your youth. The Yehovah has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So again, Melchizedek probably was a representation of Christ on earth. I think it's very beautiful what we just read here. And the Lord, Adon, okay, the Lord Christ, is at your right hand, speaking to God Most High. So I hope after listening to part one, you understand both God the Highest and Jesus Christ were both Creator, both are Savior, both are God of the Old Testament. But if God or Jehovah appears to any man, as he did to Abraham in Genesis 12, 17, and 18, he had lunch or dinner with Abraham in Genesis 18, and then that has to be, that Jehovah, that YHVH, has to be the one who became Jesus because no human has ever seen the Father. John 1, 18, John 6, 46. I might come back if there's time to read some more of those. Moses saw the back of God. This was glorified Yeshua, in future Yeshua. Uh, Moses saw the back of God. No one has seen God the Father. So it couldn't be God the Father. So much so that Moses shone like a bright light bulb himself for at least a month afterwards. And then he saw the one who would come as Jesus 1,500 years later. So yes, Jesus is the God of the Old Testament, but so is also God the Father. Both. It is totally wrong to just preach that Jesus is the only God of the Old Testament. Do not, do not sideline God the Father. So we're going to go through a bunch of scriptures now real fast. I hope you printed off the notes. Um, when I'm telling stories and things like that or, or adding to the notes, uh, those don't get into the notes. The stories are a, a short form of it, but they're far more interesting Interesting if you have it, if you're listening to it with the notes in hand. I keep saying it every time, because I know a lot of you don't. Some of you do, and thank you. Abraham, Moses, David, Daniel, the prophets, understood about God Most High and how active he was. They actively worshipped and praised God Most High, not just the Word of God. David certainly understood there were two beings. We just read Psalm 110, Psalm 2, and Psalm 8 also. Just jot those down. I'm not going to read them, but Psalm 2 and 8, you know, something about blessing the sun and all that. I don't think I have Psalm 2 in here anyway. Kissing the sun and blessing him and respecting him. How active was God the Father, God Most High in the Old Testament? Deuteronomy 32, uh, verse 8. When the Most High divided the inheritance of the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, set the boundaries. Second Samuel twenty two fourteen. I'm just going down these notes quickly. The Lord, Jehovah, thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. The Most High is very active. Psalm 7, verse 17. I'll praise Jehovah according to his righteousness. When I'm saying Jehovah, your Bible might say the Lord in all caps. That is Y-H-V-H with no word the before it. Okay, you don't put the before your name unless you're the Donald. 
but otherwise, you know, it's not the Lord. It's just simply Yehovah. If you buy a Bible in Israel where it says the Lord, they will just simply have Lord. Anyway, I will praise Yehovah according to his righteousness. I will sing praise to the name of Lord Most High. There you go again, Yehovah Most High. Psalm 9, I'll praise you, O Yehovah. The end of verse 2, I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Psalm, I'm just reading all this to make the point. God Most High was very active. Very active as God of the Old Testament, along with the Word. Psalm 47, 2 and 3, For Yehovah Most High is awesome. He's a great king over all the earth. Psalm 78, 58, Yet they tested and provoked the God Most High, the Most High God, did not keep his testimonies. Psalm 78, the verse before that says, He, God Most High, drove out the nations before them. Very active. Psalm 82, verse 6, I said, you are gods. Jesus quoted this, and all of you are children of the Most High. We're not children of Christ. And all of you are children of the Most High. Because you have made Jehovah, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, blah, 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 goes on from there. Um, I'll skip a couple. And then even demons, when they saw Jesus, uh, when he, the demon, saw Jesus. I'm, I'm reading Luke 8, verse 28, 29. Luke 8, maybe just 28. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down, at, fell down before him and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torment me. Scared to death of Jesus. What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I want to transition now to another point. What about Deuteronomy 6.4? And there where it says in Deuteronomy 6.4, the Lord, Jehovah, is one. Echad in Hebrew, E-C-H-A-D. How can we be talking about two? And this was the problem the Jews had when Jesus said he was the Son of God. By saying Son of God, you make yourself equal to God, they told him. And yeah, he was. Equal in the sense of being of the same dimension, same kind, same family. Ehad, the Lord is one. Um, let me illustrate this with a story. So about the early 2000s, I was visiting my sister Paula in the city of Redding, California. Her daughter was there visiting, one of her daughters was there also, and she had married a rabbi. I don't think they're married today, but she had married a rabbi for her husband, and of course of Jewish faith. So when we got there, we had to eat separately from them, have our own plates and cutlery and spoons and glasses and food, and could not eat with them because you can't eat with Gentiles, right? And they saw us as Gentiles, and certainly not of a Jewish faith. And at some point I asked a rabbi if I could speak with him privately to understand the Hebrew of some words, especially a word. He got kind of angry. He got very belligerent to me, actually. He said, now listen here, Philip, don't be trying to convert me to your Jesus, okay? Jesus can't be God, nor can he be Messiah. He died. God doesn't die. Messiah doesn't die. There's only one God. You know Deuteronomy, right? You know Deuteronomy 6.4, don't you? The Lord is one. One, Philip, not two, not three, not more. Just one. That's it. Got it? And that one is God. That one is not Christ, cannot include Christ, because Echad means one. I thanked him when we read Deuteronomy 6.4 together, first in the New King James. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. I showed him how my New King James had an asterisk next to the word one. And there it said, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Well, he says, I guess it can mean that, but it's, no, I, I, we, we don't accept that. We, we say that Adonai, they changed Yehovah, by the way, to Adonai, my, my Lord. 
Uh, we say that he is one, not alone. And I didn't use the words Yehovah or Yahweh because that would have been offensive to his Jewish ears and he would have walked away. So the rabbi, see there, just like I told you, one, Philip, the Lord is one. So then I read to him in the Hebrew, which he seemed to appreciate, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eluheinu, Adonai Echad. And we sing that as well. At least they do. Okay, so even in the Hebrew roots churches, they'll often sing that. But I hope, at least in some Hebrew roots, that you're not saying Adonai, because that is a change. We are not allowed, we're not permitted to change any word in the Bible, uh, or else we're cursed. But the word is Y-H-V-H. -H. Anyway, so I asked him, I said, and Echad is one. The Lord, um, listen, Israel, Adonai is our God. Adonai is one, is a translation in the Hebrew, from the Hebrew. But it shouldn't be Adonai. It should be Y-H-V-H, -H, Yehovah, or Yahweh. And um, anyway, I said, Adonai and Echad, what does that mean? So he thrust his index finger straight up, right in front of my face, about an inch from my nose. One, Philip, just one. Always one, not two, not three. Get it? It's kind of rude, actually. Don't blame my niece from divorcing him later on. Anyway, I must point out to all of you again that uh, it's not Adonai, it's, it's Yehovah or YHVH. Never tinker with God's unique holy name, guys. Anyway, God does tell us in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34 about the new covenant and one that you probably know a lot of the words to that God will give them a new covenant, not like Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, not like the one I gave you when I led you by the hand out of Egypt, out of, and I brought you to Mount Sinai. The covenant you broke, though I was a husband to them, he says. This is the covenant, I think this is verse 33, he's trying to do this. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Jehovah. I will put my law in I. Yehovah will do it, not the Holy Spirit, by the way. I will do it, through the Holy Spirit, perhaps, but it's God doing it, going back to my sermon, my video sermon, part one, about who or what is the Holy Spirit. I hope you all hear that one. Please do. I will put, it's a lot more than just the power of God. You've got to hear it. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God. They shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Hey, you got to come to know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says Jehovah. I think that's what it all says. For I will forgive them. I think it goes from there. Their sin I won't remember anymore. Um, my point is, in reading this, is that everybody will know that name in the future. It's hardly a name to be cast aside or not used. And by the way, Hebrews 10, 15 does say the Holy Spirit will write God's laws in their heart, but compare that to Jeremiah 31. You see the Holy Spirit, again, is actually God himself because the Holy Spirit is the manifestation of God, his power, his presence, his essence. The Holy Spirit is extension of God coming into us. It's the internalizing, the presence. It's God himself. I mean, back to my rabbi friend. I got distracted there a minute. So I put up my index finger to one. Echad means one, you say. He says, yes, one. I'm the Hebrew expert, remember. Yes, sir, that's why we're talking. I said, you're the expert. And that's right, he says. Well, now I have a question. I've looked up other places, the word one, and I just want you to tell me, in Genesis 2.24, it said there, this is why the man leaves his, after Eve was created, 
This is why the man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife, cleaves to his wife, bonds with his wife, and they become one flesh. I said, what's the Hebrew there for the one in that particular verse? Genesis 2.24. Well, he looked it up. He says, well, that's Echad as well. I said, but I thought you said Echad only means, it can only mean one, one being, one person. But here you have a man and his wife bonding and becoming one flesh. He says, well, let me, let me look that up. He started looking at some of his commentaries that he had. I'll have to get back with you on that. Then I said, I have another one I'd like to go over with you. I have several, but here's another one. Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, 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 I call it. Genesis 11, verses 5 to 7, Then Jehovah, the Lord, came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one. The people, no doubt hundreds of them by this point, are one. And they all have one language. And this is what they have begun to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. In verse 6, with the Hebrew, I said to him, what's the Hebrew word there when the people are one? Hundreds of people. Rabbi, looking a little more sheepish, he says it's also Ehad, E-C-H-A-D. Well, then me, uh, well, now we're talking at least hundreds and maybe more who are being described as one, as Hechad, and yet you put up your index finger to me and said, one, Philip, not two, not three, not more. Well, here we have hundreds whom God himself is saying these hundreds are Echad. That's the same word used in Deuteronomy 6.4. The Lord your God is one. So is this saying that it is possible, in fact, in Hebrew, to have more than one person and still describe them as echad, as one, as in a man or wife, or as in a group of people trying to build a tower, acting so one in their total unity? Long pause. He's checking his source books. He hasn't commented as I waited. Finally gets up and he says, I'll have to go see what Rabbi Maimonides has to say about this one of the old rabbis. Well, there are so many more examples of many people being described as one. Another one is Exodus 24, 3. So Moses came, told the people all the words of the Lord and all his judgments, and all the people answered with one voice and said all the words which the Lord has said we will do. So we know now that we have God Most High, we have the Word who was God and was with God, Two beings working together so closely, so tightly, that they are seen and described as one God. The Holy Spirit is not a separate being, is not a person separate from God and Jesus, but is a part of God Most High, is a part of the Word, as I explained in part one about the Holy Spirit. And I'll copy for you a description or definition of Echad, from the Complete Word Study Dictionary, Old Testament words. Also keep in mind in John 17, I'm just going through all this to explain, when I talk about both our Creator, both our Savior and all of that, don't be confused or troubled by the word Echad, the Lord is one. It doesn't just mean one being. All the people answered as one, in one voice. All the people in Babel, um, Worked as one. They're one people. In John 17, Jesus told his remaining 11 disciples, Judas had gone, all 11 of them, that they needed to become one. All 11 needed to become one. As one, he says towards the end of John 17, as my Father and I are one. That kind of one. So I hope it's obvious that Echad, or one, definitely can include more than one being, more than one person. So now, when we read of the Lord, Yehovah, 
the Lord in all caps, is that referring to God most high all the time, to the word all the time, or to both? Maybe by now you're catching on to my little trick here. So, um, let's talk now about which one is called Yehovah. I actually have two or three sermons that go in massive depth into that question. But let's start with this concept. John 1.18 says, No one has seen God at any time. Only the begotten Son, who's in the bosom of the Father, He's declared Him. He's seen Him too, He says in other places. Now combine all that with a couple more verses that say, Nobody, 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 no human anyway, has ever seen the Father, period. And yet, as I showed you last time, quite a number of people have seen someone depicted and described as the Lord, as Jehovah. So those times when Jehovah is seen could not have been God the Father, had to be the one who became Jesus Christ. Quickly, a couple other verses, 1 John 4, 12, no one has seen God at any time. John 6, 46, not, not anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. So now, how about the Father's voice? People use John 5, 37 to 38, the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. People think this means nobody's heard God's voice. That's not true. But Jesus is saying, and this was said to people trying to kill him, you, you're not about to hear, ever hear his voice in your attitude. You're not about to see him. That's what he's really saying. You have neither heard his voice at any time or seen his form. Verse 38, you don't have his word abiding in you. Because whom he sent, you don't believe. If you jump back a lot of verses before that to the beginning of all this, John 5, 16 to 19, um, he had healed this man on the Sabbath. I think this was the one where, I can't remember if this was the one uh, where he wanted help uh, when the waters were stirred up by the angel or if it was something else. But, but Jesus had healed him on the Sabbath, told him to get up and carry his mat, his little cloth or, or rattan mat and they thought that was breaking the Sabbath and so they're trying to kill him. He had done those things on the Sabbath. John 5 verse 16 verse 17 Jesus answered them my father's been working till now and I've been working. My father's always working I'm always working he's saying. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath but said God the father was his God was his father making himself equal with God. Not equal in authority, but equal of the kind of person. So Jesus said, you haven't seen God or heard his voice to a group of Jews who wanted to kill him. Of course they hadn't heard him. But how many times do we know that we have heard the voice of God the Father? Okay. At Jesus' baptism, Matthew three seventeen, there was a voice from heaven. Somebody heard it. This is my beloved son, in whom I well pleased. At the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John were there with him. A bright cloud comes and covers them, very frightening. And they heard the Father's voice saying, This is my Son. Now that would not be someone speaking for the Father. Only one can say, This is my Son. Only one. This is my Son. Hear him. Don't worry about Moses and Elijah. Just hear him. Peter openly confesses he heard the Father's voice on that Mount of Transfiguration in 2 Peter. Chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. Talking about Jesus, 2 Peter 1, verse 17 and 18. He received from God the Father honor and glory when, he, when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now that was the baptism. And we heard this voice, which came from heaven, when we were with him on the holy mountain. So Peter confirms 
Now he's saying, it sounds like Peter's saying that maybe just Jesus heard the, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That could be. But certainly the word of that got out. In verse 18, Peter, James, and John all heard God's voice from the holy mountain. Holy because God was there. So there you have it. Some of God's people had heard of God's the Father's voice, but nobody then or now has ever seen the Father's form or shape. And yet it's clear that people did see Yehovah. Abram, Abram, Abraham later, Genesis 12, verse 7, Genesis 17, verse 1, Genesis 18, verse 1, then Yehovah appeared to Abraham. Genesis 26, 2, and verse 24 as well. Yehovah appeared to Isaac. Deuteronomy 31, 15, Yehovah appeared in a pillar of cloud. That's not quite the same. Uh, 1 Samuel 3, 21, Yehovah appeared again in Shiloh to Samuel by the word of Yehovah. 1 Kings 3, 5, Yehovah appeared to Solomon in a dream. Here they're seeing forms and shapes. It's not God the Father. Can't be. Isaiah 6, 1, Isaiah saw the Lord in glory on his throne. Okay? He saw the Lord in glory on his throne. Exodus 24, verse 10. I covered this last time. Exodus 24, verse 10. Uh, 74 people, maybe 75, were up there on Mount Sinai having lunch with God. They saw the God of Israel. Go back and read Exodus 24 if that's unfamiliar to you. <clears throat> that was a surprise first to a lot of people, apparently. Now, continuing. So the answer to the question of who was Yehovah is this. When they, uh, it depends on context. If Yehovah is seen, they could not have been God Most High. Nobody's ever seen him. If Yehovah is seen, then it has to be the Word, who is also God, who became Jesus Christ. So you have to go by context. Sometimes it doesn't give you enough information uh, to decide, is it both or one, but Yehovah can be both. Yehovah, Y-H-V-H, the Lord, can be and is both. Psalm 110, obviously, is about God the Father. Psalm 110, clearly Yehovah here is God Most High speaking to his second in command, Adonai, my Lord. David writing it, Yehovah said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Genesis 18, 1, in the other hand, has to be the word of God, the one who became Jesus. Psalm 110, that Yehovah is God the Father. Genesis 18, verse 1, that Yehovah has to be the one who became Jesus. Exodus 24, 10, they all saw the God of Israel. That had to be the word of God. And then John 10, 30, I and my Father are one. I and my Father are one. So not one being, but one in unity, two distinct persons. So there you have it. John 10, 30, I and my Father are one. Not one being, but one in unity. Two distinct persons acting and living as one. In John 14, verses 8 to 11, especially verse 10, Philip said to the Lord, Lord, show us the Father. That would be enough. That will be sufficient. Jesus said to him, John 14, verse 9, Have I been with you so long you, you haven't known me, Philip? He who's seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show me the Father? So he said, we're that much one, we look alike, we act alike, we are alike, we seek the same goals. <clears throat> Verse 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father, the Father is in me. The words that I speak to you, I don't speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. I've used that verse several times lately because it's such an impressive, ex a, a word that explains so much. Explanatory words. The Father who dwells in me does the works. I'm just a human being at this point. With God the Father in me, though, I can do incredible things. I think also in the same chapter he says that uh, if you believe in me, you, you'll do even greater works than these. 
Anyway, <clears throat> my point in reading all of this is to remind us that Jesus says over and over in different ways that he and Father were always doing the same thing. The Father's will, the Father's plans, the Father's architecture, all of it. Jesus said every word he spoke and every deed he did were things doing the Father's will. And that's exactly and actually the Father living in him was the one doing it. That's a huge statement. John 12 now, verses 49 to 50. John 12, 49 to 50. <clears throat> For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me, the one sending is in higher, a higher position, the one who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, that's what I say, so I speak. But Jesus, Yeshua, and Abba, the Father, were one, though two beings. Don't ever mix that up, think that's one being. No. Otherwise, who would, be, who would Jesus be praying to while he's on earth? And so on. So I hope you understand that when you read of the Lord, the Lord in all caps, really, really the word for Yehovah or Yahweh, there's no the in there. So the Lord in all caps or Yehovah, that could be either God Most High, the Father, or the Word of God, Jesus, the Son of the Highest. Either one. Or it could be both. Both are Creator. The, depending on the context, sometimes it's just sp specifically one. Sometimes it's both. And both are very interested in being involved in Israel and wherever else God was working. Both are God of the Old Testament. Both are Savior. God Most High will always be the Father. The Word of God will always be the one who became the, uh, Jesus Christ. And the Word became flesh, John 1.14. Both are Yehovah, depending on the context. Okay? And Yehovah could not have been the Father if Yehovah was seen. If Yehovah was seen, that was undoubtedly then the one we know as Jesus Christ. But other times, like in Psalm 110, verse 1, and Psalm 2, and Psalm 8, there the Yehovah is God the Father, absolutely talking about his Son. I know I'm repeating myself a little bit here. I've said this before, but I just want to make sure we really understand it's both. Now, <clears throat> the two of them are so united, they are Echad, E-H-C-A-D. I'm sorry, E-C-H-A-D. I hope I've been saying that correctly all along. E-C-H-A-D, Echad, not Echad, okay? Like a man bonding with his wife, like a group intent on building a tower of Babel, they were Echad, though they were many persons, more than one. And their loving oneness must be, God's loving oneness, God Most High and, and, and the Son of the Highest, their loving oneness must be seen in us, their children. Their love for each other is what people must see as one of the greatest proofs that we are the true body of believers. Reminder, regardless of ethnicity, color, or race, that love must be strong. No prejudice. God gives us the love of God, and this love is intense in uniting God's children. The same love they had for... Two beings as one. Look at John 13, 34 and 35. Yeshua speaking. John 13, 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. The same way that I've loved you is the way I want you to love each other. Being forgiving of each other, accepting of each other, hoping the best. 1 Corinthians 13, descriptions of love that you also love one another, as I have loved you. And this is the way that everybody will know you're my disciples. If you have that kind of love, as I have loved you, if you have love, agape love, for one another, God Most High and His Son of the Highest, they set the pattern for oneness. At the end of the Lord's Supper, 
Passover. Yeshua was impressing on the disciples that they also needed to be one in the same way that he and Father were one. That united. John 17, in his powerful, real prayer of, the, of a high priestly prayer, John 17, 20 to 23, after the order of Melchizedek, not after the order of Aaron, okay? As far as the priesthood went. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's us. He is now praying for us, those who would believe in him through their word. Of course, we read their writings, their epistles, and of course we believe in him through their word. That they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me and the glory that you gave me I've given them that they may be one there we have it again just as we are one just like that I and them you and me that they may be made, may be made perfect in one and the world may know that you've sent me and have loved them as you have loved me have loved them as you have loved me. Do you realize that, that God loves you like he loved Jesus? So if Yehovah can mean both of them as one, depending on context, and if Yehovah is seen, then that one has to be the one who became Christ. If Yehovah is not seen, that Yehovah is God most high or possibly Christ. Because no one's seen God, uh, God the Father. Look carefully at context. Now, are you ready for this next one? I am. The I am is also both. You can study this more on your own. When Jehovah spoke to Moses, this was the one who also showed him his glorified back to Moses. And this was Jesus. The name this Jehovah gave as his name was I am who I am. And uh, or um, the one who is and was and is to come and all that. But the I am who I am, the great I am. Meaning he will be what he'll always be and always has been and always will be. What he being that he will be, that's the form of be, you know, the be, uh, I am who I am. <clears throat> he will be what he'll always be, whom he's always been and who he always will be in the future. But it's clearly also a name owned by Jesus. When Yeshua, Jesus, was illegally arrested in Gethsemane, he asked those officers coming and the soldiers and everything, the temple guards, whom they were seeking. When they said, well, let's read it. For time's sake, let's read it. But just know that when your Bible says, I am he, the word he, if you have a King James or New King James, is in italics. Some other translations may also put it in italics. Italics shows you it was not in the original Greek. Italics means it was not in the original Greek. He simply said, I am. That's the name of God. And the word was God too, remember John 1, verses 1 to 3. So here's the dialogue upon his arrest. <clears throat> I've taken out the he in these verses because they're added. They're in italics. Notice especially verse 6. I'll start in verse 4, John 18. We'll read verses 4 to 8. John 18, 4 to 8. Jesus, therefore, knowing all the things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am. Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. When he said to them, I am, they drew back, this is verse 6, and fell to the ground. Something about the power of that name, I am. Something happened. They drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, Whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I've already told you, I am. Therefore, if you seek me, let these others go. So Jesus also is I am. God the Father certainly is the I am. I am. 
Of course, Jesus also said, I am the door, I am the light, I am the good shepherd, I am the bread from heaven, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and a few others I probably missed. He is the I am, as is the Father. Now here, I'm going to throw another one at you. How about Alpha and Omega, first and last? Even the Alpha and Omega, it's like saying the A and the Z, the first and the last letter of the Greek alphabet, would be Aleph Tav in Hebrew, refers to both Jesus Christ and God the Father. Remember, God the Father is described as ancient of days in the book of Daniel. But look at Revelation 1. Actually, and I think verse 5 or 6 it even talks about it there, referring to Jesus Christ. So let's look at the ones where the, the beginning, the, the, the beginning, the first and the last, Alpha and Omega. Revelation 1, verse 10 and 11. John speaking, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, the day of the Lord. The prophetic time coming up. I heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Very loudly. The first and the last. It's not wrong to speak loudly, by the way. Many times you'll read in the scripture, and he lifted up his voice and said, well, right here, Christ himself is saying very loudly, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book, you send it to the seven churches. Okay, and list them. And then in verse 17, when I saw him, verse 14, 15, 16, describe what he, describes what he saw. I fell at his feet. This is Jesus he's describing as dead. I fainted right out. But he laid his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. That certainly is not describing the father. Father never died. I am the first and the last. I live. And I was dead. Okay, so I hope you understand that clearly is showing Jesus called himself the first and the last. And in verse 10, he called him, verse 11, he called himself, I am the Alpha and the Omega. That was Jesus speaking also. You can study Revelation 1, you'll see, and then he was the one who spoke all the blessings and so on and, and warnings to the seven churches. Now, in Revelation 21, here we can see how that applies to God the Father. Revelation 21, verse 5. Then he who, 5 through 7. Then he who sat on the throne, that's God the Father in this context. He's coming down from heaven at this point. <clears throat> said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. You see, God the Father and Jesus are so one. Just about almost everything applies to them. Okay? And I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Now, Jesus is not our Father. This is talking about the Father. I am Alpha and Omega. But in Revelation 1, verse uh, 11, I am Alpha and Omega applies to Jesus. So it's both of them again. And then Revelation 22, it jumps back to being about Christ. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Salvation is a gift. Reward is by works. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And then again in Revelation 22, 16, I, Jesus, okay, so this is just a few verses back from when, in verse 13, or later, uh, from verse 13, I'm Alpha and Omega, verse 16 says, I'm Jesus. I've sent my angel to testify of all these things. So please, let's never, never sideline God the Father, never, never, never sideline Jesus. They both are so actively involved, as I've shown you. The Father is first, greatest and highest. He's number one. As always, always stays active. He always stays active. 
through the word Jesus Christ, who is now also his son. I'm going to put in the notes a little bonus for you here. Do you know that Israel, the, the, the concept of God being a father, was not foreign to them? I don't think, because Jesus said he came to reveal the father, I don't think that they understood God as an intimate Abba, dear daddy. But the concept of being a father, that was known to them but not as deeply as Jesus revealed. But just write these verses down. In fact, I'll have them in the notes. I'll print it out already. Um, Malachi 1, 6. A son honors his father, a servant his master. If I am then your father, where's my honor? And then uh, Isaiah 63. Doubtless you are our father. You, O Lord, are our father, our redeemer. From everlasting is your name, and so on. So... Anyway, let's end with that. Let's ask God's blessing. Father in heaven, we just come to you, our great, great Abba, our dear daddy, and to Jesus, our Savior and our Christ, our Messiah, the anointed one. Thank you that you are there. Thank you that you're our Father. Thank you that you're our Savior. Thank you that you're our Creator. Thank you that we can talk to both of you. Thank you that we're going to marry your son, Jesus Christ, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. Thank you that you're going to be there performing that as Revelation 19 and 14 and 15 all show on the sea of glass, probably. Thank you, dear Father. We want to glorify your name. We want to lift you up. We want to take you out from being put on the sidelines. So sometimes Jesus is the one put on the sidelines. We want to lift you both up as one, as our one God, as our Echad, Echad God, the one, but united together, the more than one being, just as Adam and Eve were one, even as the people building Tower of Babel were considered Echad as well. So we thank you, we praise you, help us understand you better. You are spirit, we are flesh, hard to understand. Please, dear God. Help us see and understand and come to really know you, come to really love you, come to really identify with you. Come live in us. We open our doors of our lives to you. Come live in us. Be our life, Yeshua. Be our life. Help us to resist and fight and overcome all sin. Shine on us with your glory. Smile upon us. Protect us, guide us, give us more of your Holy Spirit, and please be, help us to be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, Yeshua's mighty name, amen and amen.